Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Yeah, it's the four o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we're doing Think Tech Asia today with Russell Yu, who joins us by a combination of methodologies from uh, Beijing in China. Uh, welcome back to the show, Russell. Welcome, uh, Jay. Welcome to Beijing. Yeah, so um, there must be some talk about uh, Mr. Trump's uh, new uh, tariffs, which were going to take place today in steel and aluminum uh, and other manufactured products around the world. Um, and I suggest to you that these, this leaves a lot of options open, maybe new, adventurous, and highly beneficial options open to China, to Xi Jinping. And what I would like to discuss with you today is what the reaction is in China, how this will, in fact, affect China, and what strategies Xi Jinping is likely to use. What do you think? Well, Jay, I think China's going to take a very major approach because um, actually the steel exports directly coming from China is very small. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very small. Um, they uh, export less than 2% of steel uh, from China to the U.S. Uh, now, however, I believe that China is looking uh, and to understand the reason behind it. Uh, does this signal a trade war? I think that's the bigger question. And I think the collective wisdom, because right now, China, the Congress is in session. I think there's going to be a lot of thinking about what is the course to uh, take at this point. Um, and I think one of the things that, that China has to its advantage is that uh, the actual tariffs apply across the board. There are no exceptions or exemptions, which means that nine out of the ten major steel suppliers to the U.S. are actually U.S. allies. And uh, I think Xi Jinping is going to wait to see uh, see their response, the response of the EU and Canada in particular, who are the greatest suppliers of steel. So we're going to see probably after that a very calculated measure and articulated response. Well, what do you think uh, the allies are going to do? I mean, some of them are not very happy. Allies are no. Um, you know, he, he, he sort of, uh, Trump sort of accepted uh, friendly nations, friendly allies, but they didn't really particularly, you know, appreciate what he's doing. And they may not be so friendly, actually, on, on a trade war. So given that, and given the fact that it's a little unknown as to whether our, quote, friendly allies will be friendly in this trade war that Trump has created, what does uh, Xi Jinping do? I mean, what are his options? I know we can't tell exactly what they are because we have to see the world react first, but what do you think his options are depending on how the differential on how they do react? Well, I think we need to look at a larger picture. First of all, if I were uh, China's uh, uh, thinking process, I would look at the reasoning behind tariffs. And none of the, there is no logic or reasoning um, to understand what is Trump doing. First of all, the reason that it's necessary for uh, the U.S.'s national security. Um, they need to make a steel industry uh, so it can build uh, fighter jets. Well, that, that doesn't work because, in fact, nine out of ten major steel uh, exporters to the U.S. are all its allies. So that doesn't work. Second of all, looking to logic that it's necessary to, uh, to uh, protect the industry. Well, there's only 160,000 workers in the U.S. that actually make the steel. There are about uh, 8 million or so who work in industries that use the steel, such as the U.S. auto industry, uh, from auto industry to the consumer goods. So I think looking at that, uh, there is no logic behind uh, the actual plan. But I think the greater picture is now we're seeing Trump's economic advisor or trade advisor named Peter Navarro. He's stepping out of the woodworks. He has been very quiet for a year. And as you may recall, uh, during the election, Peter Navarro and Donald Trump were, were, uh, were actually uh, had set out an agenda that we are going to confront China. So I think that's the greater uh, concern that one would have, that this is actually a trade war that has actually started. This is, we're on the road to a trade war. Uh, and it's very interesting because if you look at it, uh, Peter Navarro uh, has been silent for a year. America needed China to, uh, to, to assist it with 
with the North Korea rhetoric. So now that rhetoric has died down, so it looks like Trump now is, is, is doing a, a purposeful plan, uh, sending tariffs on China, mm. also igniting a trade war. Yeah, I, I thought at first it was a distraction uh, from North Korea and you know, other things that were happening around the Russia investigation. But it has a life of its own these days. Um, and we really have to figure out uh, what's going to happen. Even his own uh, staff in this morning's New York Times indicated they were not sure whether he was going to do it, uh, that what he, what he said is what he meant, and whether he would change his, his tune about this in the next day or two. So it's, uh, it's all up in the air right now. And that, and that suggests that this is just a distraction for other events. But, but let me ask you this, Russell. Um, what is a trade war? What, what exactly is a trade war, and how, how does it start, uh, how does it proceed, and how does it finish? Well, you know, there's, there's two routes to trade war. The first route is when uh, we have something brought to the WTO, uh, and particular industries are, for example, the U.S. has clamped down on the solar industry, uh, and they also are bringing investigations in China for trade practices. And China, in response to the tariff on the solar industry, which was recently uh, tacked on, uh, has come back and started an investigation on certain agricultural industries in the U.S., such as the sorghum industry, which brings in under a billion dollars a year to the farm communities in America. So I think that the next step is probably more of a diplomatic response, uh, China going to the WTO. But I can see immediate measures that can be taken. I'm not saying it will be taken. But for example, I think the, the biggest industry that will be hit will be the U.S. soybean industry. It brings in $16 billion a year. And the soy industry, as you know, is out of the Midwest. And in the Midwest, that's Trump's uh, support base. So we're seeing a possible more of a calculated response towards these industries. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think what's, what's happening is um, as you said, he's waiting to see what happens. He's waiting to see other responses. Um, but I also feel that, um, that he himself has a plan here, um, that he, is, he does not feel that he is drastically affected, I hope you agree with me, um, by whatever Trump is doing. And he wants to turn this back on Trump and back on the United States. So at the end of the day, the United States paints itself into a corner. That's why uh, you know, I think it's worth inquiring as to exactly what a trade war is. My, my humble uh, assessment of it is uh, a trade war is where I put a tariff against you, you put a tariff against me. We both build walls with tariffs. At the end of the day, um, the guy with the, uh, the higher walls um, he lo wins, I guess, and the guy with the lower walls loses. And it's a question of uh, global economic power. Um, it doesn't really do anybody any good. I suppose you could have a world without uh, tariffs, or you could have a world with lots of tariffs. And I wonder which world is better. Um, you know, all, all the free trade agreements, uh, Trump is, um, is backing out of them and, uh, uh, you know, denying them going forward. Um, is, this, is, this, is this part of his trade war? Um, and, and when China puts up tariffs, against us, what will it put a tariff up on our manufactured goods that are sold in China? You know, it may feel these days, Russell, that it is manufacturing all the things it needs. It doesn't need anything from us. So who cares um, about putting up tariffs by China against the United States? Um, we're not, you know, they're not going to import much anyway. Isn't that the way it works? I think one of the critical things, you have to look more of the long term. China's moving up the innovation uh, supply chain. I think when it gets to a point where uh, it can develop its own chips, like Intel chips, I think the game is over. Because if, you, if China wanted to, 40% of the inventory at Walmart comes from China. That means when you start putting on tariffs, uh, you know, the Americans will not be able, at least their voter base, the middle class will not be able to afford a lot of things. Things are going to be expensive in America. And I would think that, that uh, China would, would look around the globe, and I believe that all these other countries that are hurt by the tariffs will probably uh, uh, do a collective response. 
a response that's going to be coordinated. And so I think it's going to, in some sense, hurt the American consumer in many ways. Yeah, well, uh, and, then, and then you go and you say, well, it's not only the U.S. and China. It's, it's, if, if you have a, a true trade war, you having it all over the, country, the world. Uh, and there's a trade war now between some countries in Europe and the United States. Um, uh, this, this has a ripple effect everywhere you go. And I suppose in order to make a proper evaluation of it, you have to look at the goods that are being bought and sold uh, in global commerce and the resources, uh, natural resources, that are being bought and sold in commerce uh, internationally uh, to figure out who would be hurt by a tariff and who wouldn't. But if you look at manufactured goods alone, and you say, well, most of the, the goods that are sold in, on the shelves of Walmart in this country come from China, uh, it would be shooting ourselves in the foot, I suppose, you could argue, um, by putting a tariff against goods that are manufactured in China. Um, on the other hand, maybe Trump has a point, and I'd like your opinion about this. Um, we, we, we can manufacture these goods ourselves. Let's make America great again. Let's start all those factories up again and manufacture all those goods that Walmart wants to sell right here in this country. Um, and that's a factor in determining the, the policy and the strategy. Can we do it here? I ask you, Russell, can we do it here? Can we manufacture everything we want right here at home? Well, I think, I think we have to look at the, actually, 30 years ago, maybe it would be a different story than today. Most of the goods and manufacturer, a lot in China, are manufactured through robots, artificial intelligence. And in the United States, uh, you know, we may not be up the curve with that. Uh, we will not necessarily be hiring a lot of workers if we started that in the U.S. factories. So, again, um, in terms of capacity, uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, these are things that America has to rebuild itself if it's going to go back into manufacturing. But again, manufacturing will not necessarily employ the same amount of people as it did 30 years ago. Times have changed. Uh, factories are done very differently. And um, again, uh, it is a different ball game. So the reason why the steel industry has less people working in it is because of technology. The efficiencies have, have made it so that uh, you do not need a lot of human bodies around. Yeah, well, you know, this reminds me of the Jones Act, you know, the Jones Act, which, uh, which um, I guess protects American shipbuilders um, from competition from shipbuilders in, say, Korea, uh, who can build a ship at a fraction of what it takes to build a ship in Louisiana at the shipyards there, the one or two shipyards in the country. Um, it, it strikes me that um, we, we really don't have an option to build a lot of ships here. Uh, if you can put a tariff against, we have. The Jones Act is a tariff. It is a tariff against Korean ships because you can't use them in the intercoastal coastal trade. Uh, and the problem there is, uh, that has that helped build ships in this country? No. Because ships in this country are so expensive. Um, only the military builds ships, and I don't think they like it either, only the military build ships in, in the United States because they have to. Um, but ordinary shipping, no, it's always cheaper to buy it overseas. Result is that nobody is coming to this country um, to buy ships. And so if you put a tariff against uh, the Korean shipbuilding, you're only, you're only really hurting the United States. And you're hurting Hawaii, by the way. The Jones Act hurts Hawaii, and, and it hurts poor, dear Puerto Rico, uh, I might add. Anyway, fact is that um, you have to have a global view of this. And to have a tariff war at this point in, in terms of global history is really a horrendous mistake because you could wind up, this country could wind up losing it big time. And, and, and the question, you know, I would like to have some, um, some input from you on is how will China do in a, in a trade war? How will China do when the whole thing, if the whole thing gets crazy? I mean, I think Trump is trying to use it as a um, negotiating point on, uh, on free trade agreements. That's, it's, it's really a distraction, and it's a negotiating point for other issues. But let's assume there really is a trade war. Um, let's assume that um, the world is, is caught off guard. Let's assume that everybody starts building walls. I think he likes walls. Um, against, uh, against trade into that country by, by tariffs. Where does China come out? 
when you look at the goods that they're importing and exporting, when you look at the, the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative uh, into Europe and Africa and South America, for that matter, uh, where do they come out? It strikes me that Xi Jinping has options that he can play out, which will pull the rug out from under us. Not only will we not win the trade war, um, but we will suffer mightily for an indeterminate period of time because we tried that. What do you think? Well, I think one of the things that we have to look at is the big picture, and, and that is this. Um, I think you mentioned a point about the one dot, one road. Again, this puts the U.S. As allies in a very awkward position because this would mean more and more that China will have more global influence, more influence because now they're forced to, uh, European countries are even forced more to find ways to work with China. And I think that, that that's going to be a, a very big reality. The U.S. will become more isolated. And I think the other part about it is that um, some of the, the large markets here that are speaking about, like Apple, uh, you know, there are Apple phones, I believe, that are sold in China uh, last year. 100, I believe there was 130 million uh, iPhones versus 110 in the U.S. So these are definitely going to hurt Americans, a lot of Americans' interest uh, in, in actually getting their products into China. Um, I'm seeing that China is moving very rapidly ahead in the area of technology. And again, I think they'll find ways to um, use uh, to develop their technology to be a better technology than the U.S. And in the long run, the U.S. may suffer. Yeah, well, you know, I that very thought, you and I discussed this a couple of days ago, and that very thought is interesting. We, we're in, in technology-wise, we're kind of in a trade war already. Because the Chinese have developed or copied, you could say copied, and developed a lot of technology that we were doing. Um, they're, you know, they're doing, uh, gee, industrial um, technology, uh, computer technology, uh, all the robots and the automated uh, manufacturing systems. Um, they've got a lot of retail and, um, you know, personal uh, phones and, um, and related technology that makes it easier to buy things facilitate their economy. They're using their own technology. So it's not as if, it's not as if uh, Silicon Valley can export technology to China anymore. I, th I think there was a time, uh, maybe there was a time when China was looking at that very carefully, maybe copying it. Um, but now we, we can't export to them. It doesn't matter whether they put up a tariff or not. And I guess they have in some ways. Um, and, we're, and we're not going to be able to uh, import from them um, I guess if, if, we, if we wind up importing technology from them, we're going to pay mightily for it. Uh, and in many ways, they're moving ahead of us. So we're, we're kind of in a trade war vis-a-vis -vis technology. Their technology serves the same purposes that ours does, and they're pulling ahead of us. So where does that leave us? We cannot export technology the way, they used to, the way we used to, because they won't buy it. They don't need it. Um, and maybe the real issue here is not steel or aluminum, not cars, not, not natural resources, but technology. After all, you know, one technology company can be so valuable that it makes all those other companies look small. Um, so what do you think? I mean, where does, that, where does that play? Where does technology play in this now emerging trade war that actually in some ways has been a trade war for some time? Well, I think technology is, 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 I think China has really moved up the curve with technology. I think most of the um, uh, investor funds are coming to China uh, to develop, for example, financial technology. Uh, the, the promise of a greater market is here because China is such a uh, huge market of internet users. Uh, I think technology is definitely uh, a key important fact here. But gee, I think one of the most important factors that we really may ever be overlooking this conversation that I see living here for 15 years is people. And I really think that uh, the people here uh, are very motivated. Uh, they've gone through a lot of hardships. Uh, and I think the last 30 years, we've seen a rise in China. And it's because the people here, the people all are looking to make it a, a place where education is important. Uh, and I think there are using the internet, I think they're finding ways to to make a better life here. Uh, and I think I think that's a that's a, a it's something that people don't realize unless you 
live here and see the culture. People here are the move. People are, are going to, no matter what, suffer. If they suffer, I think that um, they have suffered before, uh, and I don't think something like this is going to, uh, to affect them terribly, the, the trade tariffs here. I think, it, in fact, it, I think that will affect more uh, on the U.S. side if, if expensive things, if the things from China are much more expensive. There are other ways that the Chinese can, can, can gain this. Um, so, again, I think there are a lot of options the Chinese have, but I think the most important thing, it has a lot of capability here to do things, whether it's technology uh, or other means. So um, I think that, uh, that this is uh, something that may have been overlooked a lot on the U.S. side. Yeah, well, I mean, I, as you said, um, we don't buy a lot of steel from China. Uh, there's, there's not, you know, a, a, a big benefit in putting tariff on steel from China. Um, I, we, we buy aluminum from Canada. I don't know why we want to get into an argument with, with Canada. Um, and so you know, what, what happens is I think China, here's the thing. I think China is in a better position to sell overseas at its at its um, highly efficient manufacturing rates, um, because we isolate ourselves, not only through trade war, but otherwise not, not being involved in free trade agreements. So the market, the global market, becomes all the more uh, a China global market. And if I were Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping, I would consider, you know, advancing into it and selling everything into that global market. And um, not involving myself in a, in a tariff war, um, so that people were comfortable in buying from me. And of course, you know, if they are comfortable in buying from you, they'll continue to buy from you, and you'll have a, a regular and maybe a loyal clientele uh, in various continents around the world in steel and, uh, and manufactured goods. So by isolating ourselves, however we do that, uh, we're cutting ourselves off and limiting ourselves from selling yes. into that market. And, and if I were him, I would. That's what I'd be thinking about, wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely. I would think that just uh, just to look at the few industries here that uh, the Chinese could really make a big difference into affect the U.S. Uh, for example, uh, I think uh, China is scheduled to buy an estimated six thousand eight hundred airplanes from Boeing over the next twenty years. That's going to be uh, about a, worth a trillion dollars. And with with this. China can simply say, we're going to switch a contract, and we're going to go to Airbus. We're going to go to the European competitor. Uh, and again, that's going to really affect uh, the American industries. If you just take one or two industries, it, it, the soybean industry, that's a $16 billion industry a year. If China decides to, well, we're going to go elsewhere to get our soybeans. These are all different things which, which, again, I think are going to be a bigger hit on the U.S. side. Yeah, but I think you pointed out something very important, and that is we put up a wall and we say we're not going to buy your stuff, and they say, okay, fine, um, because you're being aggressive like that and, you know, uncooperative and unfree, so to speak, um, then we, we are going to make things um, that we would otherwise buy from you, like Boeing planes. Um, and so we will, we will make them. This is a big opportunity for us to make things and, and, um, and block you out of the market. And you won't be able to sell it to and us. And, you, and, and we will be selling our new uh, Chinese Boeing planes everywhere in the world. And we'll be competing with you head on. So do what you like, Mr. Trump. But we're going to take advantage of the vacuum. And we're going to sell these new things we're going to design and develop uh, to everyone. And I think you've raised a really good point here, uh, Jay. Um, for example, uh, this year, I believe uh, Airbus um, ha is working with China to develop its, its first uh, Airbus out manufactured in China. That's going to happen this year, from what I understand. So I, I can see China will say, well, okay, well, if this is going to be the situation, we're, we're going to develop our own planes. Uh, just like the uh, the bullet trains that they've developed. They've developed their own uh, tra uh, trains now. It'll happen with jets. Once the Chinese are able to do that, now you just push the Chinese over the edge, and they do that. Uh, you'll see uh, that the industries such as Boeing will be greatly hurt in the U.S. Yeah, you know, you, you raise another point there. Essentially, it's that 
um, that trade wars and this kind of isolationism um, does to change things. It does tend to change things. And, you know, inherent in, in that change is the question of whether the change is temporary or permanent. And I suggest that, uh, you know, history keeps on moving forward and you can't reverse it so easily. And if you decide some other time you don't want to be an isolationist country and you don't want to have tariffs like this, um, you know, you can't go back home again. You can't go back like a yo-yo to where you used to be because the actions you've taken in the interim have actually changed things. They change things for, you know, the people you are building barriers against. They also change things for you. And I, uh, just one other point I want to make is when I was a kid, um, the system in New York City uh, had a strike. And, um, you know, people were really ticked off about that. And they decided, well, if, if they can't ride in the subway, they would ride on the bus. And so everybody began riding on the bus. And then, then the strike was settled on the subway. No more strike. But you know what? People kept riding on the bus. And that's the problem here. You know, you can settle this, all this tariff um, negotiation that he's talking about. But at the end of the day, the, we lose. At the end of the day, people will change their countries, will change businesses, inter, in, inter, international businesses will change their way of doing things. And we will, we will have less of the pie than we had before. Well, it's time to close, Russell. Can you give us a closing comment about what you would advise both Xi Jinping and Donald Trump to do uh, to avoid uh, a negative result for one or the other? Well, I, I think this is an opportunity for China to continue to using the diplomatic channel as well as going to the uh, WTO mechanism. Um, I think it's a chance for China to exercise global responsibility and leadership uh, to work with the uh, uh, work of the European community, community uh, and all the other Asian countries here who are greatly affected, for example, South Korea, which is a major exporter of steel to the U.S. Again, uh, I think these are all opportunities for China. And I think, uh, I think Xi Jinping and China will, uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, they may understand what a global economy uh, really is, uh, where I think uh, President Trump doesn't realize that today's world, um, it's no longer a manufacturing labor economy. It's, it's, it's an innovation, uh, technology economy, and knowledge economy. And I think this is what the opportunities are here. Uh, that economy uh, of manufacturing steel is long gone. That's the old economy. So I think these are the opportunities uh, for uh, China to, to move ahead in, in a different path. No, oh, yeah, and I would add that uh, in terms of advice, I would advise President Trump to get off this thing about isolationism and backing out of free trade agreements and putting tariffs up. It's not good for the country. It's not good for him. And if he thinks it's going to help him um, by distracting public attention from other issues like the, the Russia probe and other things, uh, at the end of the day, it's not worth it. It's uh, not going to do that. And people are getting really Akamai, including Xi Jinping, about when he means it and when he doesn't mean it when he's using it as a distraction. <clears throat> and I think that, that his uh, credibility has sorely been uh, undermined by his own inconsistency. Anyway, that's just my thought, my two cents. Thank you very much, Russell, for this discussion. I hope we can get together again in a couple of weeks. Aloha, Russell.